we pray for each other and for our world and for those that we know and for ourselves as well, that we might be involved in whatever God is directing us towards. Let's join together as we pray. Father, we thank you for this precious day. We pray for all of these on our prayer list, for those engaged in protecting our country and the freedom that we enjoy. We pray for safety. For those who are studying your doctrines for their confirmation class requirements, Lord, we pray your blessing. For those engaged, as we must from time to time, in a war with disease or troubles, finances, the cares of this life, we pray your strength. Father, as we meet in a spirit of worship, sitting at your feet to learn, to pray, to fellowship, to be challenged by your word and led by your spirit, and sent into the world with your love. We are joined, we're knit together by a bond of peace. Grant that the joy we sense in this holy moment would compel us to understand the chaos of tribulation that people in Ukraine are experiencing right now. Our so-called freedom, Lord, is a facade if we do not use it to extend all we have and all we are to those who are suffering. For the least of our brothers and sisters, those confined to nursing homes or their own homes, we pray for peace and comfort. We also pray for ourselves that we might be the bringers of that peace and comfort. Lord, we do pray for those who have the responsibility to govern, make clear heads and peace-minded ways be their chosen paths. We pray all of this in the name of he who is the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and our coming King. And all of God's people said, Amen. If you have your Bibles handy, we are back in the book of Revelation. No surprise there. It's been about four or five hundred years that we started this thing again, it's in Revelation chapter one. We are in the next to last and last chapter this morning. Revelation chapter 22, and then the first five verses of, of Revelation chapter 21, and the first five verses of chapter 22. I'm not going to read the entire uh, text this morning because we did that a few weeks ago. Speaking of a few weeks ago, the last uh, couple of times that we have met, and this morning and probably the next couple of times until the end of this series on the book of Revelation, uh, they have been our reward for, as Debbie mentioned, the first 20 chapters of the book of Revelation, because the first 20 chapters talk so much about what? Plagues and war and uh, retribution and punishment and all the things that are going to happen to people who have thumbed their nose at God. Well, the last few weeks have been our reward because we have begin, we have begun to look at the city of God these last two times, and again this morning, this is kind of a uh, mini-series within the series, three parts about the city of God. Uh, three, three weeks ago, we looked at the place that is called the new city of God, the new Jerusalem. Then uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the people. Last week, we had a special service with <laughs> baptism and receiving of new members. Uh, so we skipped Revelation last week, but now we're back in it one more time. We talked three weeks ago about the place, two weeks ago about the people, and then this morning we talked about the purpose. The purpose of God fulfilled in the new city of God. Now, to fulfill something is to do what? Is to take something that is old or in process and bring it to completion, to bring about the ultimate purpose. That's what we're talking about this morning. God has always had a purpose. He's the God of design and balance and beauty and order. And in our text today, he takes the ordinary believers of all history and he fulfills their destiny. This is the culmination of everything we have been thinking about as we've studied the book of Revelation this past year. He takes all of the countless unnamed church members of all ages, including the struggling, loving Philadelphians, the lazy Laodiceans, and all of those martyrs and all of the survivors down through the ages, 
And God does what God has always been in the process of doing, what has always been in his heart and mind. In this text, he takes the entire family of God, he gathers them all together, and he makes us feel quite at home in the New Jerusalem, the city of God. That is the fulfillment of the purpose of God. You realize that everything that happens in your life, everything that's ever happened in your life, everything that has ever taken place in human history has pointed to this purpose, that we might be restored to God, that we might be put back together with him. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Think about all these people that uh, were represented on the Ukrainian map there, scattered all over the place now, in every direction. Did you notice the arrows went in every direction? Now think about the church of God. Think about God's people throughout all of the ages. Think how scattered we have been. My goodness, just think about Methodists scattered all over the map. Methodists scattered, scattered all over the theological map. Progressives, conservatives, traditionalists. Mm, my goodness, we are all over the place, aren't we? But God's purpose, God's ultimate purpose has been and has always been and will continue to be until that day to bring us together with him. He'll correct whatever things we think that are wrong. He'll straighten us out where we have had a faulty look at things. <clears throat> I want you to notice with me this morning the completion of the fulfillment of God's purpose here. The perfectly new relationship where there's no wrong thinking, there's no wrong speaking, there's no anger, there is no agenda other than the great relationship that God is going to make with all of us. What is it going to be like? Several different points that I'd like to make this morning about that come from our text. We'll pull out selected texts as we go through this. Pray with me for just a second. Lord, unhinge our minds so that there's no door between thee and me. Lord, open our hearts that we might receive your word. And then, Father, be deep down into us, into our souls and spirits, and change us so that we might be the kind of people on the kind of mission that is consistent with the fulfilling of the purpose of God. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What's it going to be like in that new city of God, in the new relationship where it's absolutely perfectly new? First of all, there is going to be unhindered intimacy, or intimacy unhindered. Revelation 21, verse 3 says that John said, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. God's purpose from the time of Adam's fall has been to restore Eden's intimacy. That was God's purpose in the first place. Genesis 2.18, God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. You remember that from the creation story? God said it, it is not good for man to be alone. Now the fact that man, God made man in his own image, listen, this is important. It indicates the reflection here that it's not good for God to be alone either. Did you realize that? When God said, it's not good for that man that I created to be alone, what did he do? He gave him a woman to tell him what to do, right? Well, come on. <laughs> I know it's Sunday, I know it's early, but you know. The fact is this, God created the man, knew that it was not good for the man to be alone. I knew, um, certainly God knew in his heart of heart and in his mind that it was not good for the man to be alone, even when he created him alone. But sometimes God does stuff so that we will see. So somebody said one time that God uh, sends tests sometimes, but it's not so that he'll see whether we can take it or not, or whether we can live through it or not, but that we will see that we can in his strength, you see? And same thing with the creation. He created Adam in the garden. He knew that it was not good for him to be alone, 
But here he's saying in Genesis 2 and verse 18, it's not good that the man should be alone. This means that God understands that because God understands he doesn't want to be alone either. He wants that perfect relationship with his creation. C.S. Lewis said it this way, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I like that. I like that. I was not made specifically to spend forever in this world. I was made for another world. Certainly not as this world can uh, exist. Well, better applied to this text is the reality here that we are made for more than this or any other world. We are made for close fellowship with God. And sin has the peculiar effect of separating us from God rather than bringing us closer. We think somehow we'll be happier if we have this, want that, uh, get around God this way because you want what's on the other side. But in reality, we will be unhappier because sin always separates us from God. And the one thing, the one purpose that God created us for and the need that he created us with is to be in fellowship with him, to love God and to be his children. In the New Jerusalem, the city of God, we're not going to have closed gates. We're not going to have space. We're not going to have darkness or anything that will prevent the free access to the very presence of God. The purpose of God removes every obstacle to his purpose of intimate fellowship with us. What does the scripture say? We shall see him face to face. To face. You've heard that at every funeral. We will see him face to face. Besides intimacy unhindered, we will see him face to face. There's also to be integrity untainted. Verse 4 of our text, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. You know, there is a sense in which the former things dog us all the days of our life. Did you ever notice that? Let me see the hand of everybody who has never had a regret. I'm glad there are no liars in this congregation. Right? <laughs> we've all had regrets over things perhaps we've done or the way something has turned out. How can we have nothing between God and ourselves? How can there be a perfect relationship when the memories of our past failures bring tears to our eyes? Oh, I wish I hadn't. If I could only go back. And the death of loved ones brings us sadness, even the memory of losing a loved one. This is just about the anniversary of my cousin Gary's death. Gary was uh, just about a year younger than me. That will get your attention when some of the people you've known best throughout your life. Gary and I slept in the same bed whenever I visit his house, he visit my house. We were far enough apart, we couldn't go home for the day. And so, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of beds available back in those days. And so we would sleep in the same bed. We talked about when we were like five, six, seven years old. And, you know, our, our, our mothers, it was, it was a survival thing. I think our mothers brought us together just to put us out in the yard together and, you know, have a break for the day. But uh, the, the whole point here is this. Um, the death of loved ones brings sadness. And there's also so much pain in the world today. Integrity is a relationship of complete oneness. How could God have anything to do with death? He doesn't. Death is somewhat alien. I've heard it said that death is part of life. It's not part of life. It has no part of life. In life, there is no death. In true life, there is no death. In fact, everyone, whether they love God or not, is going to live forever. The question is, what is the address? Where are you going to live forever? Our sin and this sinful existence separates us from the complete rest of mind and soul. And in order to have an untainted integrity, an untainted wholeness, something where there's absolutely no spot or wrinkle, as the scripture puts it, we must have a complete relationship with God, total relationship with God. And sin will always break that up. New things require a clean 
sweet. As a child, I did a lot of things that caused myself pain. Very often I cried, and I would come to my mother all bruised and broken, and I could still feel the brush of her hand as she would wipe away the sweat and dirt and tears. And, and I can remember the way it felt so good to be near the one who was comforting me. And that's what this text is pointing us to. I mean, if that is possible for a child with a human mother, how much more refreshing of our integrity, of our wholeness, when the Father above wipes away all the former things. And I think that it's not going to be a long process. I think in some way the Father is going to wave that hand. And it's going to happen all at once. Integrity, wholeness, there will be no brokenness whatsoever in the new kingdom of God. And then, not only is intimacy going to be unhindered and integrity untainted, but inheritance, our inheritance, will be unmeasured. Verse 7, all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. When someone inherits, it's based mostly and visibly on two things. First of all is death, the death of the person who grants the inheritance. Jesus' death on the cross was an act that sealed the Father's will, <clears throat> made us inheritors, if you will. The second aspect is relationship. That's the other factor. Death and relationship are what seal an inheritance. As a recognized point of law, blood kin and adopted kin are both entitled to inheritance. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in our laws, blood kin, obviously, you know, what can you do if a child is, um, you know, leaves home and you never hear from that child again? To be certain that the inheritance goes to those child, those children who are, or whoever you want your inheritance to go to, you can do what? You can disown that natural child, can't you? But what about an adopted child? Did you know that in law, an adopted child cannot be disinherited? Look it up. What does the scripture say about children of God? Are we not adopted by God? God was making a very uh, poignant statement here when he called us his adopted children. The victorious believers of whom John writes here are those who cling to the blood-stained cross and his name. Even the prodigal son knew that it was, it was not enough to recognize that he was in the pig pen and far from the father. What did he have to do? He had to get up and go to the father. And he was received. Beloved, the only way to be there when the inheritance is handed out without measure is to be related to the Father. And that's possible. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, To all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. So we have three things so far. Intimacy is unhindered. Integrity is untainted. Inheritance without measure. And then fourthly, identity, which is unmistakable. I love this part of it. Revelation 22 and verses uh, 3 through 4, no longer will there be a curse on anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and the name will be written on their foreheads. The name on the forehead is an obvious reference to, but opposite to the mark of the beast. We've seen enough of that. Uh, those who take the name of Jesus will have his mark. I'm not so sure it's going to be a fiscal mark. I think it's going to be most likely an identifiable character. Have you ever been somewhere and somebody asked you, are you Christian? You know, if, if they weren't trying to evangelize you, why did they ask that question? Well, it's because they noticed something about the way you conduct yourself. Something about the way your attitude is. And maybe the way you speak. Maybe you talk friendly about God. Maybe you talk about Jesus. And so that person wants to know, are you a Christian? I think it's going to be that kind of thing. We will be 
identifiable by the way we act. We are going to be transformed into the image of Christ, and that's what we're looking for in the first place, isn't it? In Romans 8, 29, the Apostle Paul put it this way, for, wrote, <clears throat> for God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. That choosing is the adoption. So that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. I think that the only real trouble with the church in any age is when we have an identity crisis as believers do not live up to the name. When we don't even try to be conformed to his image. We have the name Christian. What does that name mean? It means little Christ. It means disciple of his. I've got a question for us today. Are we becoming what the name implies? The pastor says that his servants are going to serve him. Do you know what that word means? It has a special meaning in scripture and in relationship to the time in which this was written. To serve. This particular word, there are many different words for what we translate as serve, but in the original language of scripture, this word has a special meaning. And it's used only in the New Testament to describe doing things for a master that only the most trusted slave would be permitted to do. What that means is that the family of God, his forever family, is going to provide for our Lord what nothing else in the universe can do or be, we are going to provide family. The one thing that God said it was not good for Adam to be alone, to do without, is his family. That reflects back on who God is. God is saying, I cannot live without my family. That's why he loves you so much. That's why he wants you so much. You are the beloved. You are the beloved. We are his, and God wants no other. Child of God, you should not have an identity of crisis. You are wanted and loved by the God eternal. You are needed by him. Nothing else in God's mind and heart will do except you. Dwell on that. In the fulfilled purpose of God, you and your identity are going to be unmistakable. And with that comes the last point I want to make this morning, is that there's going to be insight unending. It's all going to be opened up to you. Revelation 22, verse 5, there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Great author Victor Hugo said, I feel within me that future life. I am like a forecast, a forest that has been raised. <coughs> Pardon me. The new shoots are stronger and brighter. I shall most certainly rise toward the heavens. The nearer my approach to the end, the plainer is the sound of the immortal symphonies of words, worlds which invite me. For nearly half a century, I've translated my thoughts into prose and verse. History, philosophy, drama, romance, tradition, satire, ode, and song. All of these I've tried, but I feel I haven't given utterance to the thousandth part of what lies with me. Now this is what, this is what Victor Hugo wrote. <laughs> when I go to the grave, I can say, as others have said, my day's work is done, but I cannot say my life is done. My work will recommence the next morning. He goes on to say, the tomb is not a blind alley, it is a thoroughfare. It closes upon the twilight, but opens upon the dawn. I guess we could say that heaven allows for the fullest expression of all that can be described as life. All the secrets of the universe are going to be open in the city of God. Our line of vision is going to be unhindered for eternity. Paul said that we will know 
even as we are known. As a baby in the cradle, I received tender and loving care from my mother and my dad. And I was satisfied as a baby to eat, to burp a little, and to sleep. Frankly, my entire universe revolved around warm food and clean diaper. That was it. As an, ex as an adult, I've experienced much more than that. I've held my own babies. I've held grandbabies and great-grandbabies now. I've stood at the edge of the Grand Canyon in awe. I've flown around the world. I have lived, I've learned these past nearly 75 years. There was always much more to life than just inside of that cradle in mom's eyes. And life has been good. But then, when my eyes open on a different world, there will not just be more. There will be no limit at all in the city of God. God's purpose is throwing the lid off the limits for his beloved. That's why, Debbie, the scripture says, no mind can conceive. It hasn't entered into our heart. Nor can we ever imagine what God has prepared for those that he loves. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.